Welcome everyone to MLB Tonight, presented by Camping World. It's Greg Amsinger with you, with my good friends. Thanks to our NTT Home Play Cams. We got Carlos Pena and Dan Plesak. Dan, I haven't seen you in forever. It looks like you've gotten taller. A little bit taller, Greg. The weather, the spring is around now, the temperatures. I'm kind of in bloom right now. Maybe a half inch taller than I was when I saw you 30 teams in 30 days. Uh, Carlos, it looks like you're itching to get back to Studio 3. Am I right? Yeah, no doubt about it, man. I can't wait for baseball to return. Uh, trying to stay active, Greg, uh, but obviously there are restrictions that we're trying to respect. But I can't wait to get back between the lines. You know, for us, it's Studio 3. We can't wait. You know who agrees with us is Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred. He made an appearance last night on CNN and talked about baseball's potential return for a shortened 2020 season. And he discussed details regarding testing for COVID-19 and how that could impact things for Major League Baseball. Watch this. You know, all three of us watched this interview on CNN last night. And Carlos, I don't know if you had the same reaction that I did, but I came away even more optimistic than before that baseball is going to come back. Yes, Greg. I mean, uh, the idea is this. Baseball is like the heartbeat of this country. So obviously all of us want it uh, back on, on TV because it, it's our lifeline. You know, it's the country's lifeline. And look, you can see the commitment of the commissioner to bringing it back. And yes, it's going to be a challenge to come to a... Uh, an agreement with the baseball, uh, with, the, with the Players Association, but I think also the Players Association is willing, wants to get back on the field. So I am optimistic that, that they will reach an agreement. And you know, Dan, you, you know, also Greg, discussed the potential of quarantine real quick, that if a player does test positive, it doesn't mean that necessarily the sport's going to shut down. He had a lot of details and logistics that he explained that there will be a facility at every site where a player, if they were to test positive, would go into a quarantine and they would look at all the players that he was in contact with. Player safety, from what I got from that interview last night, is the number one concern from the commissioner in Major League Baseball. Did you get that takeaway as well? I did, Greg. And I think, listen, as time has gone on, we've learned more and more about the coronavirus. We've learned more about the testing. We, we've, we've become better. And I would assume that when and if baseball does start, we're going to continue to get more information, the best information that is out there. And I think the health and safety of the players, the coaches, the personnel that's going to be around the team is first and foremost. And I think both the players and the commissioner's office understand that. And these players will be treated and handled the best way to try to keep as many people away from the players. And it will be our, it will be a difficult watch. And I've had more people come up to me, Greg, in the last two to three weeks that really miss watching baseball will it be different with watching without any fans in the stand yes but i think yeah. right now people are really jonesing for some baseball uh three of us are fingers crossed they get this figured out they've been talking with the union all week so uh, we're hoping that this will all work out in the meantime what should we talk about let's dream about baseball how does that sound guys the mlb <laughs> dream bracket two uh, what is this? How it works? It's a 64 team bracket, folks. Best ever single season teams, two entries per franchise. This is including the 94 Expos, and I'm so thankful for that. One of my favorite teams ever. And three Negro League rosters are in there. All teams from the last 75 years. Now, each head to head matchup is a best of seven series. We're talking simulation, folks. We got Scott Braun, John Paul Morosi will be giving you recaps, commentary on these series. Uh, look at the tournament overview four regions, two AL, two NL. No franchise can have two teams in the same region. Teams are seeded based upon a combination of postseason, regular season win percentage, and run differential. I'm sorry, Harold Reynolds. Run differential is included in the formula for the MLB Dream Bracket 2. World Series winners, they do take a little bit of a priority here. Let's jump into the brackets. I, do you guys mind if we go into the region? Because I, I love college hoops as well. So anything we can, if we can mix baseball and like an NCAA tournament bracket, it always gets me going. It gets me really fired up. So let's look at Region 1 AL. And there are some great teams here, great series. Uh, Red Sox Rays, 04 Red Sox, 2008 Rays. Go down and get the 54 Indians against the 05 Astros. O's, M's from 1970 and 95. Carlos, is there a matchup here in AL Region 1 that stands out to you? Well, Greg, I have to go to the 2008 Rays versus the uh, 2004 Red Sox uh, reasons are obvious. I was part of that 2008 team, all right? So I'm uh, slightly biased and rightfully so, as I should be. But I'm also very smart to recognize that the 2004 
Red Sox are legendary. They are the ones who broke the, the curse of the Bambino, and they had this ridiculous comeback um, when they were down three games uh, to none um, against the Yankees to advance the World Series. That was absolutely crazy, that comeback. So I know that we're up against, um, you know, just a monster of a team. But you know what? I'm going to bet. Um, I'm going to bet on the race, of course. Well, why not? I mean, look at the left-handed thunder that you guys had in that lineup. Carlos Payne and Cliff Floyd. Woo! I mean, yes, man, sir. I feel, yes, sir. Feel sorry for the right-hander on the mound that day. All right, let's take a you look better at believe it, Region 1. <laughs> yeah, if you look at this bracket, you got some talent. You got you got 75 res against the 07 Rockies. Just think about the offense there. You got the 67 cards against the 82 Brewers, 69 Mets against the 97 Fish, and then the 55 Dodgers against the 84 Padres, among others. Dan Plesak, which first round matchup really gets you excited? Two teams close to my heart, Greg. I was drafted out of high school by the Cardinals, then I was drafted out of college by the Brewers. Rematch of the 82 World Series. Brew Crew, St. Louis. Two different styles, right? The Reds, the, the Redbirds known as a team more that could run and steal some bases. That 82 Brewers team, Harvey's Wallbangers, Mauder, Young, Cecil Cooper, Gorman Thomas, Ben Ogilvy, Charlie Moore against that Cardinals team. How about Mike Shannon in that lineup? Yeah. Luke with some speed and Kurt Flood. How about Tim McCarver, Orlando Cepeda? This is a marquee matchup from the 60s to the 80s, kind of old school, nude school, maybe slight edge towards the St. Louis starting pitching, but somehow, some way, I think the Brew Crew, Harvey's Wallbangers, they itch this one out. You guys are as excited about this as I am, which gets me, I'm, I'm happy. I'm really happy. Let's look at the second regions because that's where my eyes are focused. Okay, this is AL Region 2. So many talented teams here. The 2019 Astros against the 91 Twins. Think of style of play, that how that would clash. That'd be crazy, right? Stroh's loving their bullpen, although they had Verlander. But think about it, just two completely different styles. But I want to hone in on one matchup. The 1984 Tigers against the 1988 Oakland A's. Now, the 89 A's, which won it all, they're not even in this. This is the 88 Athletics. They were 104 and 58. The same record for the Tigers, but they got there completely in completely different ways. Okay, when I think of the 84 Tigers, I'm thinking of Jack Morris, man, on the mound, Willie Hernandez. He was the MVP and Cy Young. You got that left-handed weapon coming out of the pen. Uh, they had great starting pitching, but they had to mash up against the, the, the A's. I mean, you got Canseco, you got McGuire, you got Dave Henderson, you, you got the Bash Brothers, you got Ricky Henderson and Dave Parker. That, to me, is awesome. In the National League, when you look at Region 2, so many fun teams to look at, but one of my favorite teams from the 90s squared off against my favorite team from the 90s. The 1994 Expos are my favorite team. It's, to me, a crime they couldn't finish it off because of the strike. They were 34 games over 500, squaring off against Barry Larkin's 1990 Cincinnati Reds, who had an incredible October run. But this is a, this is a squad that pulled it off with the nasty boys in the back end, they had great athletes everywhere all over the field. And then you had the Expos with Larry Walker. They could steal bases with Marquise Grissom and Moises Alou. This was a really good team, man. Uh, I, I'm telling you, I love that. As for this matchup, it also comes from NL Region 2. It's the Padres against the Giants. Now, what is so unique about this matchup, fellas? It, it's the two genius minds that are managing these teams. It's the younger Bruce Bochy against the older Bruce Bochy. I don't know which Bruce Bochy's a better manager. Dan Plesak, <laughs> if you had to weigh in on just the on just the mastermind of Bochy under that huge cap, which Bochy would you give the edge to? The 98 Padre Bochy or the 2012 giant Bochy? 2012, more experience, he's seen a lot more. He was getting accustomed to that World Series thing. Anytime you've had some success, I think the older Bochy does okay I'm with you on that I think that's gonna experience only helps a manager thanks for playing along that was a lot of fun uh again the dream bracket part two uh is good tv this is even better we come back happy birthday to you George Brett's birthday then why are you so mad man it's your birthday we'll talk to him and look the pine tar game next
MLB Tonight is presented by Camping World, making RVing fun and easy since 1966. Visit CampingWorld.com today. Welcome back to MLB Tonight, presented by Camping World. Well, Sunday afternoon in the Bronx, July 24th, 1983, seemed like a rather routine day. The Yanks led the Royals 4-3 in the ninth. Goose Gossage on the hill, one out away from sealing the win. At the plate, longtime Yankee nemesis George Brett. What ensued was one of the most bizarre moments we've ever witnessed on a baseball field, and a string of events followed that didn't conclude until a month later. Bob Costas has more on an afternoon that will forever be known as the Pine Tar Game. It started like this. Well, he's out. Yes, sir. Is out. Look at this. And ended like this. The Yankees are three up, three down here in the bottom half of the ninth inning. But considering the drama of the earlier acts a month before. And a demon man. He is out and having to be forcibly restrained. The finale was pretty tame and actually a little comical. And there's the crowd here tonight, uh, all 34 of them. On July 24, 1983 at Yankee Stadium, the Yankees led the Royals 4-3 with two out in the top of the ninth. With a man on base, George Brett came up against Goose Gossage. Deep to right field. Holy cow, I don't believe it. Home run for George Brett. I don't believe it. As Brett circled the bases, Yankee manager Billy Martin, always looking for an edge, told home plate umpire Tim McClellan that the pine tar on Brett's bat was too close to the barrel, and therefore, the bat was illegal. I heard over my right shoulder, hey, pal, you got to check the bat, pal. You got to check the bat. He's got too much pine tar, pal. And Martin has a very valid argument here. And if he wins this, there will be chaos. And they are about to make a decision, and this could be a momentous decision. You remember the hit? Oh, out. I can't believe that. Wait a minute, I, Bill. I can't Wait a believe minute. that. They did that to Simon. Brett is upset, and I, don't, I can't believe that, Phil. They are holding George Brett out there. Three men are holding him. It's one of the most unbelievable endings I have ever seen. Well, the guess. game's over. The, the Yankees game. won it 4-3. Unbelievable. Look at George Brett. He is still furious. You're a madman here. Yeah, I don't I don't know what, what happened. I, I swear I I just remember going in the locker room after that whole thing was over and I couldn't breathe. They they gave me the brown paper sack. And, I mean I couldn't breathe. I was just so gone and mentally uh, exhausted, physically you're exhausted. Hyperventilating. Yeah, I mean I was I was having a tough time breathing. That's the maddest I've ever been in my life. And, you know, I, I he cheated. <laughs> well, I don't know what else to, you know, call it. He cheated, man. The Royals, of course, contended that Brett hadn't cheated and they appealed the ruling. The next day, the league made its ruling. George Brett got his home run back today and he got his bat as well. Sunday, umpires ruled that Brett's ninth inning home run putting Kansas City ahead of the Yankees was in fact an out because Brett's bat had too much pine tar. Well, today the president of the American League decided that the rules were too much. The pine tar part itself is a little ridiculous because the pine tar really doesn't have that much effect on what happens. While the ruling was appealed, the resumption of the game was rescheduled for August 18th at Yankee Stadium. There was an additional complication, though. The final appeal wasn't actually turned down until 3.45 in the afternoon on the 18th. An appellate court judge said, play ball, you will play at 6 as scheduled. So the KC Royals playing from Detroit did touch down at Newark at about 4. So that night's mini game at the stadium had lots of good seats available. Missing from the Royals lineup that night was the guy at the center of the whole mess. Seems his outburst after the pine tar ruling was not well received. I was kicked out of the game for some stupid reason. Why would they throw me out of the game? <laughs> I can't so see anything went, that would justify that. I went that. to a bar. We had to fly in on an off day. You guys had a mutual off day. And, and I went to a bar right by the airport in, by LaGuardia and watched the game on TV. <laughs> what Brett saw was this. Even before the game was restarted, Yankee manager Billy Martin came out on the field. And they opened by trying to make it a farce, contending via an appeal play that George Brett missed touching the bases on his controversial home run. Different umpiring crew than last time, but they were ready with a notarized statement from the previous ump stating Brett touched them all. 
With Billy Martin now out of protest options, what was left of the game began. Earlier that day, Martin had called the game a mockery. And so as the Yankees took the field, it was clear he was treating it that way. Let's take a look at the Yankees' defensive alignment right now, which may furnish you a surprise or two. Don Mattingly is at second base. Now watch this next shot. Ron Guidry is in center field. That's Guidry playing center. And so the game resumed. Two outs, top of the ninth. Hal McRae up against the Yankees' George Frazier. Struck him out, and that retires the side. On to the bottom of the ninth. Kansas City leading 5-4. Yankee rookie Don Mattingly stepped to the plate to face Royals closer, Dan Quisenberry. Sheridan is there for the catch, one out in the bottom half of the ninth. Roy Smalley then flied out to left, so with two outs and nobody on, and the crowd in some sort of odd frenzy, up stepped Oscar Gamble. He was the Yankees' last hope. And that may do it. Frank White over to John Wathen, and the Pine Star game is over. The Yankees are three up, three down here in the bottom half of the ninth inning the final score, the Kansas City Royals five and the New York Yankees four, I think. I think that is so fun. George Brett's pine tar game can be seen right here on MLB Network tonight, 10 p.m. Eastern. Every single pitch, all the drama. You got to check it out tonight on the network. But still ahead, let's talk about the pine tar game with the star of it. George Brett, the Hall of Famer, and the birthday boy, joins us after the break on MLB Tonight. You said it best when you said the man is a natural born hitter. Oh, he's an exceptional one. One of the best in baseball. Home run for George Brett. And that is number 3,000. George Brett has his 3,000 hit. And like we said, George Brett can hit. One of the greatest to ever hit in the history of this sport. Uh, take a look at this list. It's a very short list. We're talking Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, Stan the Man, and George Brett to hit 300 better. 300 more home runs, 3,000 more hits in the history of the sport. Albert Pujols right there on the line with a 300 average on the nose, and he's got more time left on his contract. Welcome back to MLB Tonight, everyone. We are so excited to welcome in Hall of Famer George Brett, who's kind enough to join us on his birthday. So, George, <laughs> first and foremost, happy birthday, man. And other than hanging with us, what do you have in store on your big birthday? Well, with the coronavirus going on, I basically do the same thing every day. I get up about 6, 6.30, try to do the crossword puzzles in the newspaper, the Ken Ken, the Sudoku, read the paper, uh, take my dog on a three or four mile walk. Uh, usually been, I've been playing a lot of golf, but the last three weeks I haven't played because I pulled a hamstring uh, uh, playing golf, ironically. But uh, it's one of those things that the range is closed and I, tr I slam the trunk of my car because they won't let you store your clubs at the at the uh, club at the uh, golf course anymore. So I put them on. I walked to the first tee, took one practice swing, took a swing and grabbed my left hamstring and went down. And uh, so I might go out and try to play, uh, play nine holes this afternoon. But uh, it's the same old stuff. I, I, I walk my dog. I try to work out and uh, I barbecue something almost every night. Hey, George, it's Dan. To make you feel young again, go back to 1974. You hit your first big league home run off of Fergie Jenkins. What do you remember about it? Uh, I'm pretty sure it was in the old ballpark in Texas. And when I mean the old ballpark, it wasn't the old one because they just put the new one in this year. And the old one was, uh, I think they started to play in 94. My last game was at the old, old stadium uh, there. And uh, I, I don't remember much about it. I don't remember the score of the game, but I do remember hitting a home run, the first one off Ferguson Jenkins. And it was, uh, you know, he's a Hall of Fame pitcher. He's had, he had a great career leading up to that and had a great career after that. So to get your first home run off somebody that was well known as him, it was a, a pretty, pretty big thrill. You know, what's crazy, George, is that you're 67 years old. When you look as young as you do, and you're like a childhood hero of mine, 
But the number that's even more eye-popping to me, 50 years with the Kansas City Royals organization. But what, yeah. when, when someone tells you you've been in one organization for 50 years, what, what comes to mind? Um, loyalty. I mean, they, uh, I signed with them the day after I graduated school, uh, was in the major leagues two and a half years later. Um, you know, you sign uh, a couple one year contracts and they trusted me at a very early age to give me a five year contract. Um, about three years after signing that they came up and they said, we'd love, love to give you a five year extension. Uh, so I did that about four years go by. They give me another five uh, five year extension. So they showed a lot of loyalty in me, loyalty in me and trust in me. And I trusted the organization. Now, would I have stayed in this organization if if they were bottom feeders and, and never making the playoffs? Probably not, because, you know, I, every every player wants to play on a world championship team. And when I came up in 74, uh, the Oakland A's were the World Series champions. 75, they were the World Series champions. We beat them in 76, uh, lost to the Yankees in a tough uh, series. Uh, went to the playoffs again in 77, lost to the Yankees in the last game of the playoffs again. Played the Yankees in 78, lost to the playoffs again. 79, we didn't make the playoffs, but I think we only lost our division by two games and then won the division in 80. 81, 84, and won the World Series in 85. And that's right when I signed that last contract. So, you know, if, if, if we were coming in last place every year, I probably wouldn't have signed the second extension, but I did because here we're in the playoffs almost every year. And and um, I thought after 85, we would, we would be in again for five or six, seven years till the end of my, uh, until I retired. Unfortunately, we never got back in. 85 was our, our last really good run at it and um but it was still fun and 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 uh right now there's uh denny matthews our radio announcer who signed with the royals in 69 and has broadcast every game since and uh art stewart uh, a scout in the organization was one of their first hires when the royals became a team in 69. so i'm the third longest tenured employee of the royals and i'm, and I'm pretty proud of that i wow. really am that's great you lead right now the kansas city royals and pretty much every single offensive category. And you did it in, with a very peculiar a stance. You used to lean back on your back leg. I want to know, what was your approach at the plate? Where do you get that stance from? And, you know, who do you model that sweet swing after? Um, I'm ready. You just go ahead. Okay. Start, start well, taking notes. I, I, never hit three, I never hit 300 in the minor leagues. Uh, uh, I hit 290 in rookie league, 270 in A league. And from that, I went to triple A, which I don't understand, but uh, held my own there. I hit 282. Got called up to the major leagues for a short time. Uh, third baseman Paul Shell sprained his ankle, so they brought me up. I played the first two games and uh, went one for four in each game, and then I didn't play the rest of the time. Uh, Paul Shaw came off the disabled list two weeks later. They sent me down, called me up at the end of the season as a September call-up. I ended up hitting 125 uh, that year. Uh, the next year, they traded Paul Shaw. And about two weeks, two or three weeks into the season, they brought me up and basically let me play third base. At the All-Star break, I was hitting 200 with, I think, one home run, and, and it just wasn't pretty. And Charlie Lau was our hitting coach, and he just sat there and watched and watched and watched. And I remember the All-Star break in 74, he came up to me in Cleveland and said, I want to sit next to you on the plane and pick your brain a little bit. I said, okay, fine, let's do it. And uh, we talked. And, he just said, look, I'm one of the only coaches that think you could you have a future in Major League Baseball, but you're going to have to change some things. And so the first thing he did, I went from hitting like Cario Skremski in 1967. I used to stand straight up, held my bat straight up in the air, uh, more of a back leg swinger, never had a weight shift, didn't get arms extended uh, very often. And the first thing he did moved me off the plate. He got my bat more parallel to the angle which the ball was going to come in. I had a bad habit of wrapping my bat around my head, which made my swing real long. So we couldn't get that bat wrap out. So he just said, put the bat on your shoulder. So I put my bat on my shoulder so I couldn't wrap it around my head and move me off the plate. He got me to lean back, have a nice load with my lower half, get extension through the ball. And, and, uh, and thank God he did because, uh, you know, 20 years later, I was still playing in the major leagues and uh, made it to the Hall of Fame. And I really don't think I would have made it to the Hall of Fame or played 20 years if it wasn't for Charlie Lau. He taught me an awful lot about him. Great stuff. George, the pine, pine tar game, Tim McClellan, you come out of the dugout. Have you ever been that mad? Were you surprised you could get that angry on a baseball field? 
you know, I, I'd get mad once in a while, but two minutes later, I was laughing. I mean, after this, it took me about 20 minutes later to laugh, uh, laugh it off. But it was, uh, I remember running around the bases and then seeing Billy Martin out of the corner of my eye as I was going back to the dugout. And I'm sitting in the dugout, and I think I was sitting next to Frank White, and he said, they might call you up for using too much pine tar. And I swear to God, I just got out of my mouth saying, if they call me out for using too much pine tar in a bat, a rule I've never heard of, I'll run out there and I'll kill one of those SOBs. And as soon as I said that, <laughs> McClellan turns to me and looking for me in the dugout. He scoped for the dugout. He goes, here you are, you're out. And I flew out of there. I, I don't even think I hit the steps. I think I went from the ground to the field, you know, because I saw the video right there. I mean, it was amazing. And I'll tell you something funny. I got uh, I got a bat. I'll show you this bat that I got. <laughs> this is bat. awesome. This was a bat I used my last year playing, and I gave it to Mike Boddicker. It's got a little crack in it. This bat right here is 10 times worse than that bat was. And as you can see, the label <laughs> right here, I mean, that's the Hey, Don, you can still see my fingerprints here. <laughs> but my father was that over, and he wanted me to sign it. And I, and I got it in my hand, and I'm just going, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. And he could tell that I, I don't have any game-used bats of mine, real ones. And so I'm sitting there looking at it, and I'm going, oh, my God. He said, well, if you want to keep it, keep it. And I said, well, how about this? I'll make a trade. Every year we go to Cooperstown. Everybody, all the Hall of Fame players sign a bat, and then they mail you one shortly after you get home. I had a Hall of Fame bat here from about three or four years ago. It had 60 Hall of Fame signatures on it. I said, here, I'll trade you. He said, you got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> that is so good. I love it. George, before we let you go, we're airing the Pine Tar game here on MLB Network, along with a few other games that you played in. Uh, 50 years from now, if a baseball fan wants to watch George Brett's three favorite games he ever played in, and you could rank them and we could watch them, what would George Brett's three favorite games be? Um, the Pine Tower for one, because it showed my desire to win and the intensity which I played with, but I still had a lot of fun. I think obviously that uh, third game of the playoffs, that was the best game I've ever played in my life um, uh, against the Toronto Blue Jays being down 2 nothing, and, uh, and just having, I mean, I made a play that I've never even practiced before. And, you know, the one thing I regret about that game, and I always prided myself, Dan, and you played against me, is, is, uh, is hustling and, and trying to take extra bases. My second at-bat in that game still haunts me. I still have nightmares about that because I hit a home run off Doyle Alexander, my first at-bat. My second at bat, I hit a home, I, I hit one. I thought it was, I hit it good, but my arms weren't quite extended at contact. But I still thought I hit it good enough, and I didn't run hard out of the box. And Jesse Barfield, the right fielder, jumps up, no outs in the third inning, I think it was, uh, no fourth inning. It was the top, bottom of the fourth inning, and he jumps up, barely misses it. I should have been standing at third base. It should have been a triple. It was only a double, and that still haunts me to this day. I, 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 I am so embarrassed to watch that at bat. Uh, thank God my teammates, Hal McCray and Frank Wright, I think Hal McCray got me over and Frank White got me in with a sacrifice fly. Uh, we ended up winning that game by one run. And then if we would have lost that game, we would have been down, you know, three games to none. And, um, but uh, those guys picked me up. I was able to score the winning run in the bottom of the eighth inning and on a single after I got a single. But uh, that, that really haunts me to this day. And I think the other one, even though it wouldn't be a good game, would just be the the World Series when we won the World Series in '85. We won 11 to nothing. Yeah. It was that good of a game to watch. After a while, it was pretty intense for about the first four or five innings. But that's just one that you, you'll never forget. Just seeing that clip right there. I mean, I'm starting to get goosebumps right here. And Dan, you did you ever win a World Series, Dan? You never won a World Series. I mean, the feeling is just incredible because I don't care. If you were Brett Saberhagen, the Cy Young Award winner that year, I think he was, the MVP of the World Series. I don't care if you were Buddy Bianca Lana or Onyx Concepcion or Greg Pryor or the clubhouse kid. When you got in that locker room after the game, everybody had that, exam, that same exact feeling that we're world champions. And that's what's so special about the Chiefs this year winning the Super Bowl. 
the Royals in 15, us in 85, whoever's going to win the World Series this year, if we ever get back to playing, uh, that, they'll never forget that feeling. They'll never, ever forget it. And that's why those are the three games I would probably watch. Oh, I'm not going to forget this interview. This was a gift to us, George, on your birthday. So Thank you. thanks for your time, George Brett. And once again, happy birthday, buddy. Okay, thanks for having me. But coming up next, it's less than four weeks away from the 2020 MLB Draft. Our prospect guru, Jim Callis, joins us for all the details after the break. Home Plate Camp is presented by NTT. And welcome back to MLB Tonight, presented by Camping World. We are less than four weeks away from the big MLB draft, and this is going to be unlike any other. Uh, a year ago, 40 rounds this year, five rounds. Take a look at MLB.com's top 10 prospects. Number one, the uh, All-American bat, Spencer Torkelson of Arizona State. As you see this top 10, you're only going to notice one high school player. That's in number seven, Zach Veen. Is this going to be a theme for this 2020 MLB draft, which you can see exclusively here June 10th? right here on MLB Network. Joining me now, a guy that puts his mock draft together just this week. It was fun to read it. Jim Callis of MLBPipeline.com. He'll be alongside on June 10th for our coverage of the draft. Uh, Jim, I, I want to start there. How do we gauge high school talent when they didn't play high school baseball because of everything that's taking place in the country? Yeah, I mean, some of the warm weather areas of the country got you know a couple weeks of high school in, some scrimmages. Although, I don't think a lot of people realize, Greg, the most important time to scout high school players is the previous summer on the showcase circuit when they're playing the best of the best. You know, like there's a kid up near me here in Chicago, Ed Howard, best shortstop in the draft. He's not going to face that much premium high school competition during a typical season. You really need to see Ed Howard the previous year. We'll be talking about this next year. If we don't have summer showcases in college summer leagues this summer, which who knows, it, it doesn't look great for that right now. We could be going into next year flying blind. But this year, I think teams, while they wish they had more looks at guys, do have a decent amount of information on high school and college players. All right, a decent amount of information, but not as many rounds to draft players. How are big league organizations addressing this 2020 draft right now? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think from the team standpoint, from a, a if you want to call it selfish scouting and player development standpoint, everybody wished they had more rounds and they don't. I, I do think with a five round draft, it's going to look very similar to how the first five rounds of last year looked. I, I still think we'll see a lot of the top high school players get paid. Teams will find a way to pay them. Um, you know, we could, instead of seeing the senior sign strategy in round six to 10, where you take a college senior for a couple thousand dollars and use that money to pay a high school guy in the third round, maybe, I think we might see some college juniors getting squeezed a little bit in the fourth and fifth round. Since this year, if you don't get drafted, you can only sign for $20,000. I think teams will leverage guys a little bit that way. But I, I do think all in all, it, it will look like a pretty normal draft or pretty normal first five rounds. It will just stop abruptly after pick 160. Okay. Well, let's talk about pick one, if you don't mind. Is Spencer Torkelson sure. a slam dunk atop this draft? I think in terms of who's the best prospect, yes, he is a slam dunk. I, you know, it's still, it feels weird to say this, but I think just because people aren't out and about and running into people as much and everything's being conducted over Zoom meetings, I think the vast majority of them would be surprised if it's not Torkelson. I mean, Greg, this guy's bat is so special. You know, I always talk about how I like the power guys who can hit. Well, this is a guy who, who has 70 or 80 raw power, who has, he might have 70 hitting ability on the 20 to 80 scouting scale. I had one scouting director wow. tell me he's the best hitter he's ever seen and this guy has done this for more than two decades that he thought if you want to put Spencer Torkelson in the big leagues tomorrow if the Tigers took him they could I mean this guy might be the best bat in the draft in terms of hitting and power since Mark Teixeira back in 2001 you know first base only it's a little bit unusual for a guy who might go 1-1 although he is athletic enough that, that he might be able to play left field but it's not going to matter I mean this is the type of guy who could hit 300, 35 plus homers. You remember last year we raved about how good Andrew Vaughn was. This yeah. guy's better than Andrew Vaughn. And people thought Andrew Vaughn was the best combo hitter in a while. So the Baltimore Orioles have the number two pick. More than likely, Torkelson will not be there for them uh, based on Correct. your analysis. What will they have at their disposal for that number two overall selection? 
It's interesting. I think it probably comes down to two players. One of those would be Austin Martin out of Vanderbilt, who is the the best pure hitter in this draft. You know, the position's a little bit in question. Teams were hoping to see him at shortstop this year. He opened the year at third. He didn't throw real great there. He moved to center field. I mean, this is a guy who led the SEC in hitting and on-base percentage last year as they won the national championship. Um, he's not huge raw power, but he's such a good hitter. He gets to everything he has. So he'd be one option. I think the other obvious option would be the best pitcher in the draft, Asa Lacey from Texas A&M. It's plus fastball, slider, changeup. He's even got a curve that's close to plus. He's, he's throwing more strikes this year. You could argue because there's so much college pitching in this draft, and the Orioles pick again at 30 and 39, that they're probably better off going hitter. I, I still think you take whoever you think is the best player, and if they think it's Lacey, they should take Lacey. There's also a, a little bit of a school thought. It's... I think more kind of rumor mongering than than concrete at this point. You know, there, there's Nick Gonzalez at New Mexico State, who who's projects as a second baseman. He's a very good hitter, very similar to Martin. Um, you know, Cape Cod League MVP. He's probably a guy who goes in the four to six or seven range. And you know, you always have kind of talk like, what if they took him and cut a deal and had more money to get a guy at 30 or 39? So that talk's flowing out there a little bit too. We're so excited. We can't wait to bring it to you less than a month away here on MLB Network. Jim Callis of MLB Pipeline, well done. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Greg. Up next, we preview a unique day of programming on MLB Network, some of the best Game 7s of all time. We'll give you our favorites when MLB Tonight rolls on. MLB Tonight is presented by Camping World, making RVing fun and easy since 1966. Visit CampingWorld.com today. Sad news to report, Bob Watson passed away Thursday night. He played 19 seasons in the big leagues, 14 of which with the Houston Astros, where he was a two-time All-Star. He was the second ever African-American general manager and the first African-American GM to win a World Series, which he did with the Yankees in 1996. Here now, Matt Basgersian with more on the life and career of Bob Watson. Bob Watson spent a lifetime in the game of baseball. Nearly six decades in the big leagues, including 19 seasons as a player. But baseball wasn't the only sport Watson excelled at. I played linebacker in high school, and I made a decision early on that I wanted to play baseball. Watson was signed by the Houston Astros in 1965 as a 19-year-old free agent and would make his Major League debut the following season. He spent over a decade with the Astros as an outfielder and first baseman and twice was named a National League All-Star. In 1975, a league-wide contest commemorated the one millionth run in baseball history. And on May 4th, Watson was credited with the honor when he hustled to score on a Milt May homer against the Giants in San Francisco, where he beat Dave Concepcion, who had just homered in Cincinnati by seconds. It was something that, you know, you definitely don't plan for. And if I hadn't sprinted to score the run from third base, that's how I scored the millionth run. Watson was traded mid-season in 1979 to the Red Sox, and on September 15th, he established a major league record by becoming the first player ever to hit for the cycle in each league. Watson joined the Yankees as a free agent following the 79 season. He played on their 1981 pennant winning team, though the Yankees fell to the Dodgers in six games in the series, where Watson hit 318 with two homers and seven RBI. Watson was traded again, this time to the Braves in 1982, where he'd remained for three years before retiring in 1984 after a nearly two-decade playing career. The following year, he joined the Athletics as a hitting instructor and was the bench coach for the A's 1988 pennant-winning club. That offseason, Watson returned to the Astros as assistant general manager, rejoining the organization that had brought him into pro ball as a teenager. In 1993, Watson was named the Astros' general manager. He would leave Houston to become the Yankees' GM after the 1995 campaign. There's Bob Watson, the GM for the Yankees. Watson was one of the unheralded architects of the 1996 championship club. 
In addition to hiring Joe Torre to become the Yankee manager, Watson also engineered the acquisitions of Jeff Nelson and Tino Martinez in a trade with Seattle, as well as Joe Girardi in a deal with the Rockies. That season, Watson helped guide the Yankees to their first World Series title since 1978. Hayes waits. The Yankees are champions of baseball. Bob Watson became the first African-American general manager to win a World Series title. He'd retire from the Yankees following the 97 campaign and went on to serve USA Baseball as chairman of the selection committee and GM of professional baseball operations, overseeing the gold medal winning team at the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney. When a young man is playing with USA Baseball, he's wearing the U.S. colors, he's representing his country, he's representing what this game is all about. Watson spent the ensuing decade working in the commissioner's office and became heavily involved with the baseball assistance team, which helps members of the baseball family who've encountered financial, medical, or psychological hardship. On May 23, 2017, Watson was honored in Houston as the recipient of the Baseball Assistance Team Lifetime Achievement Award. The hundreds of people who have benefited from the Baseball Assistance Team owe a debt of gratitude to Bob for the good work that he did in that area. Bob Watson was one of the most respected men in baseball, a man involved with the game for more than a half a century. His contributions to Major League Baseball will forever be remembered. And welcome back to MLB Tonight, presented by Camping World. On Sunday, you must watch some of the best Game 7s of all time will be on our air. Uh, guys, I know my favorite. Carlos, 2014 Giants-Royals. I'm picking that as my number one. What about you? That's a pretty good one. I'm going to go with the Cubs and Indians in 2016. That was an exciting game. You know what? I'm jumping in if you're a Yankee fan. Don't watch early at 8 a.m. Yankees D-backs, Louis Gonzalez, that little flare off of Mariano Rivera making D-backs a winner. This was a fun show. I I'm happy to be back chatting with my guys, Carlos and Dan. And how fun was it to talk to Hall of Famer George Brett, especially when you consider we're all talking about the, the Pine Tar game here on MLB Network. Uh, and also, how cool was it to talk to him on his birthday? That was an added bonus, if you ask me. Hey, hey, on his birthday. hey, hey, guys. There's another, uh, there's another Hall of Famer that uh, has a birthday. I don't know if you're familiar with <laughs> that, but he's not. George Brett's not Ozzie. the only one, Greg. Ozzie Smith's birthday's today? <laughs> Close, but no. Uh, God, is it your birthday? It's Maltese. It is. Me and George Brett <laughs> oh. together. That Thanks, was guys for that was bad me. research. I, I apologize, John. We're going to talk to our research department. Um, Oh, okay, well, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Us. Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. What, what, how are you spending the day? Well, uh, I was hoping I'd get a call from you guys. That didn't happen until recently. <laughs> um, but uh, now that it, did, we got this uh, taken care of, I, I'll probably head to the, I don't know, hit some golf balls, I guess. Okay, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Well, that, that does yeah. it for our show. Uh, for Dan Carlos, my name's Greg. Once again, happy birthday to Hall of Famer George Brett and John Smoltz. Let's clean it up, guys. Dan, Carlos, join me in this. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, John. Thanks, guys. Happy birthday, brother. Appreciate it.